Welcome to the Under the Lights podcast. The podcast for up-and-coming cinematographers, lighting camera operators, and photographers. Learn from the professionals and land the bigger projects. Please welcome your host, Cy Gamble. Hello and welcome to episode 6, the final episode of season 1 of the Under the Lights podcast. We're taking a planned break after this episode just to have a few weeks out, recoup, rethink and get some new guests booked in. I want to once again thank you all for listening, for commenting and subscribing. It's really made all the blood, sweat and tears that goes into making one of these podcasts worth it. If you'd like to send us any suggestions for the next season of Under the Lights podcast, please do so by emailing hello at utlpod.com. We'll gladly receive them. And I'm pleased to say we've got a few ideas for next season and a few interesting guests that will help take us in a different and inquisitive direction. Before we welcome this week's guest, Ali Hutchinson, onto the podcast, I just want to drop a quick reminder that the competition to win a signed copy of Doug Allen's book, Freeze Frame, concludes this Friday. And make sure you enter for your chance to win. Right, let's get this week's guest on, Ali Hutchinson, who's a up-and-coming freelance DOP from the northeast of England. He's had a really interesting route into the industry, which has led him to work on projects such as Netflix, Sunderland Till I Die. I'm really pleased to welcome Ali to the podcast. Ali, if you could just start by giving us an introduction, give us a little bit of a flavour about what kind of work you do. My name's Ali Hutchinson. Um, I guess I would now probably start uh, eventually define myself somewhat as a as a director of photography in in some capacity. My my kind of journey, I guess, started from, you know, always having um, creative parents, so creative parents who were, were definitely by no means in, in the film and TV industry, um, but were creative enough to, to see my dad as an artist working daily on, on things that intrigued us and things that I kind of, you know, I always kind of, I guess, didn't understand really truthfully what he did, but he could have fun and enjoy his life whilst also making a living from it. Um, so I guess all of all of those things then fed into me kind of I guess being more creative and having access to to cameras and and things that I, were, I was kind of always around I guess through school I was I was massive into BMX like BMX was my like die hard thing that was all I cared about um, so through kind of having a lot of mates who were very talented on on bikes and stuff I eventually kind of started to, to venture into I guess deciding to film a lot of my my mates and stuff. Um so a lot of them had had eventually had sponsors and and you know brands that ultimately needed kind of content of them riding their product or wearing their t-shirts or whatever it might be. Um so I've I eventually kind of started to film these guys and started realizing you know there was a bit of money in in that and at a at a young age of you know I'd probably maybe 16 um started figuring out like oh like people pay for this kind of thing like you know yeah. I, I i was totally naive totally just <laughs> happy to wheel the camera around for free but actually <laughs> these brands wanted to pay a bit of money so um i guess from from that then kind of developed the ideas of thinking right well you know did that for a lot of years and and loved it and had a lot of success with it and worked with a lot of great brands um but then kind of realized that you know if i wanted to I always loved films, so I kind of always wanted to to kind of venture into something slightly different, I guess. Off the back of, of deciding to go to Northumbria, I, I figured that there was a lot of successful people that I'd heard of from the Northeast who'd gone to this university. Um, so through that, I kind of decided that that would be my route into the film and TV world, I guess. Um, and off the back of that, in my second year, through a mutual friend, um, Stephen Aitchison, um, who worked in BMX but also worked in the film and TV industry, who was a clapper loader and still is. Um, so he he kind of I messaged him and was like, "Look, mate, I'm at university. I'd love to get some work experience. Um, is there a way for me to kind of you know come on set and see what it is that you guys do? Because I had no idea about the reality of of all of this. To me, it was just a complete and utter." You know, it was a different world. It was it was something I couldn't ever attain. It was nothing that I could ever be involved in in my mind. 
and um, I did a few bits and bobs of camera training in, in my second year of uni as a bit of a work experience thing um, and loved it and, and just was like, I remember doing the first 13 hour day and to me, I'd never done a 13 hour day in my life. Like, you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd done little bits and bobs of jobs, but I'd, I'd, 13 hours to me was just, you know, that sounded like torture. Um, but actually I loved every second of it and I, I, I wanted to be on set every day after that like I, I remember I did a week straight with Steve and and came off that week and was just like I want to do that again so did you have any experiences at university any any lecturers or anything that came in to obviously help guide you through your career one of our lecturers uh, um, James McDonald who was by far my one of my favorite lecturers there he'd organized for one of the ex Northumbria University students to come in um and that student was Cy Bell, um, who, who was a massive, massive DOP. Um, and at the time, we all kind of, well, a few people on the course kind of knew who he was and and um, knew that he was someone definitely to kind of, you know, acknowledge if, if ever you got the opportunity to meet him. Um, and he came in and, and gave a talk and he just came off the back of Ripper Street with Amazon. Oh, wow. Um, so he was kind of giving us all a, a chat on, on Ripper Street and, and kind of breaking it down and saying, you know, this is how he approached the pre-production side. This is how he's lit it. And, you know, just generally taking us through his career, I guess, as well, up and up until that point. And I'll never forget kind of off the back of him, him coming. Uh, I just thought this is my opportunity to, to, you know, to have a word with him and, and collar him, so to speak. And I just went up to him at the end of the, the lecture and just said, look, mate, like, I want to be doing what you're doing. Like, how do I get there? Like, I, I know a few of the people that you might know and, you know, I was trying to break a bit of common ground there. Um, but just loved everything that he, he was doing and really wanted to find a way to how I could be involved. So off the back of that, he got me on a, a short film that he was shooting with um, a couple of people from Game of Thrones and what have you. Um, so that, that was my route in, if you like. Um, and off the back of that met, met, um, a few other people that now are, you know, definitely pivotal in my in my career up to now. In inverted commas, I don't like calling it a career because I feel like it's not even started. But but yeah. So from that initial bit of training, how daunting was it for you to obviously go on to the big sets? I think it I think it freaked us out because I, 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 it was the unknown. You know, going into the unknown, like I I didn't know the breakdown of how the how the camera system worked. I didn't understand um, people's roles necessarily. You know, like I always used to used to kind of have this idea of how it would run on a set. Um, and that wasn't necessarily completely wrong, um, but it, I was definitely totally naive to the reality of it. Um, but I loved just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting, Steve, Steve Aitchison was very good at not expecting that I would know all these things and not expecting that I would know all the kit. And, you know, I was, I was definitely a, a minimal role in the sense of like, he, he knew that I was totally green to it and, and didn't really, understand a lot of it so he, he was great at easing me in but I, I totally just took it on board and just ev- every bit of information that he that he gave on that day and, and that week I, I just took in and, and just wanted to know more and just always whenever it was appropriate I always questioned like oh so how how you know how does this work or why do you do that or why have you got a routine for this or um and just learning why people are very you know specific with what it is that they do and, and the routines that they do and and so a lot of those things I think I took away from it and, and kind of tried to implement on on my university shoots that I was then doing in, in final year and stuff when I was shooting those those projects I just kind of try to I guess surround myself with people who would be willing to kind of take on board some of the things that I was maybe bringing off that experience I guess without trying to impose it on anyone I was just trying to trying to say like, look, this is how they do it on set. Like maybe we should start trying to, you know, get involved and, and try and hopefully when we leave university, we're kind of a bit more like prepared for going on a real set, I guess. So, so no, it was, it, it was good. All those things definitely fed now to, to kind of learn and learn a lot of things quickly, I think. Um, but all, all good things that have, I think stood us in good stead to kind of, just be willing to learn constantly and never, never feeling like you've completed it. Like, you know, it's not, it's not something that you ever conquer. You know, I, I don't think I'll ever get to a day where I go, do you know what? I, I just know everything. Like, and I don't need to know anymore. Like, I always feel like I've got stuff to learn and I'll always feel like I don't know enough. So 
I guess that's probably just me for the rest of my life, really. That's it, and I think that humbleness lends itself well to to this industry. Um, can you tell me about some of the standout projects that you've been involved in between then and now? So off the back of doing doing the the short film that side got us on, um, I then started to kind of get more regular. I'm, I met actually a, a really really big person in my life now is is Steve Sinclair. So I met Steve Sinclair, who was a focus puller on on that short film. Um, and Charlie Bradloff, who was a loader. So those guys I met and they were working on off the back of either, sorry, they were doing um, a show up in the Northeast called Wolf Blood. Um, so they they were both working on that quite regularly and they were getting me in on, on camera days where they were doing B camera days. Um, so I started working a lot with those guys and kind of on and off through probably for two years, I, I was doing camera trainee stuff but always knew that I wanted to shoot stuff more and, and wanted to kind of be more hands-on, I guess, and and wanted to just, yeah, wanted to just be shooting more stuff of, of my own, I guess. Um, so off the back of that, I started working a bit more with Steve Sinclair um, and he kind of just, you know, he, he was a total mentor to me and, and taught us so much very quickly. And off the back of that, we both found ourselves in a position where we, we're starting to go into the rental company, which was Pitch Cannon at the time. Um, which shout out to Jamie Hutchinson, um, who's not who I'm not related to, but have the same surname. Um, but he, so he, he, Steve had decided that he was going to go to the rental company and work there full time. Um, and then when he did that, I was kind of doing days and helping out here and there. And then I decided, uh, well, Jamie decided that he he wanted to offer me a job there as well. So. Uh, that was for me the perfect opportunity to learn kit, to learn about all these things that I didn't know about in a physical sense, um, and have you know access to Alexa Minis and all of these crazy things that for me I just had never even touched before, um, and and it would open up an opportunity for me to to shoot things of my own and and to be put on jobs that maybe I wouldn't have ever ever been considered for because I was working for the rental house. Um, and where it was appropriate, Jamie was looking looking for opportunities to put me on jobs. So working there, and obviously a fantastic job to have. Did this open opportunities and conversations with other DOPs? Definitely. I mean, there was so many. There was producers. There was directors. There was you know assistants. There was so many people that I just had kind of heard of in passing, and you know I'd, I'd suddenly met all these people who were coming to, to coming to Picture Cannon and wanting to try kit and wanting to take a look at things, and suddenly like you know I was not by any means on the same level of, as any of these people, but I was, I was someone that they knew in a face that they could put a name to, you know, and that, that for me was, was a massive battle. And like, if I, if I could be established as, Oh, that's that alley kid. Like for me, that was kind of like, you know, I've done something right there because they remembered my name or yeah. whatever it is. So, yeah. so that, those things definitely, gave me an opportunity to be on on productions like i say that i just would never have been involved in so i think that the second week that i was there um jamie had, had and, and steve sinclair had managed to get a, a, a contract i think with barber who are you know the jacket company um who were based yeah. up in the northeast um we started doing and off the bat of that we started doing commercials um via one of their contacts there who was ian west um so we kind of started straight away with I was focus pulling on on stuff that I'd you know I'd, I'd never really focus pulled and and Steve was like right you're going to come and focus pull this commercial that we're going to do and you know he he threw me in completely at the deep end but it was sink or swim and like it was one of those instances where we just made it work and by no means did I know really what I was doing but it was sharp so it kind of worked. Um, did the job. It did the job. Yeah. So, so those those like things started to feed. Those, those were kind of happening more and more. So those opportunities were coming up more and more whilst I was at Picture Cannon. And one of one of the big ones that eventually came up was um, a Netflix series called Sun Until I Die. So that th- they were coming to to Picture Cannon for all of the camera kit and all of the the bits that they needed to obviously do the job. So whilst all those guys were coming in and prepping and, and, you know, selecting cameras or selecting lenses or whatever it may be, they were seeing my face, they were seeing Steve's face and they, they then obviously at some points needed crew for, for that, those days. 
on the first series and I, I think I ended up doing two or three days towards the end of the series and they like suddenly I was a camera operator on a on a Netflix job you know when the year prior I was a mm-hmm. camera trainer like I, I just didn't know how the hell I'd got to where I was um but I was so grateful for the opportunities that had kind of just fell into place I guess to then allow me to 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 do that and be on a job like that like it was just crazy like I still still now I just think it's mental that when I hear myself say that it's it is crazy but it happened somehow so and it's a great series as well I've I've watched both seasons and I'd go as far to say it's probably one of the best football documentaries that I've I've seen it was mate it was I mean like like I say I, I was only on a couple of the days on the first series but the second the second series we did me, Steve Sinclair and Scott Coulter, another DOP, we did all of the match day stuff alongside the, the official DOP who was Diego Rodriguez. So he shot the first series and did a lot of the stuff on the second series. So we were, we were doing all the camera and um, all of the match day stuff, sorry, on on the second series. And it was great. It was a great team. Everyone there was, was lovely. Um, all of the kind of, you know, the people who were on the job, for the, for the duration of the year were all lovely people um, and it was really nice to do a job of a decent scale um, that was a Netflix job in the northeast because up until then there was very few if not any jobs like that kind of going on and especially in the sports world like obviously football is a massive thing in the northeast of course it is but um, it was just it was it bizarre because for me as a massive football fan not a Sunderland fan I'll, I'll add but um, as a massive football fan, like the world's colliding of like, you know, high end cinema cameras and, and football was just like uh, unheard of. And, and suddenly like the opportunity popped up and, and yeah, we, we were all on this job. So it was, it was, it was crazy. And it was amazing insight into the, the logistics of a football team that, you know, we all have strong opinions of whatever team we support and what have you. And, the real, the reality yeah, yeah. of what goes on behind the scenes, like I'd never really had that insight, and something until I died definitely provided that because it was just, you know, you saw so much of what went on, and there was a lot of politics involved, and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of executive decisions as to why we maybe couldn't film a, f- a certain player on a certain day, or you know, a lot of a lot of those things that you just otherwise just would never have really considered being a problem. Um, and yeah, it was it was really good, man. I, I I really wish it had went for a third series, but I know there's obviously a lot of a lot of things going on with what with why they wouldn't do a third series. But you never know. Now they've been taken over, they might do it. They might do another one. So fingers crossed, mate. Who knows? Definitely fingers crossed. I'd I'd love to see a new season. Just want to ask you about the overall look of the documentary. I mean, it's really consistent throughout. And how, how much input did the the DOP? Uh, Diego Rodriguez how much input did he have over the overall imagery because I've worked on something similar to this before where you've got essentially 10 self-shooting PDs running around the place how how difficult or how easy was it for him to control the overall look of the, the documentary I mean the, the the look I guess he set the look so much because he obviously like I say he did the entire job for the first series so he obviously set the look of like you know bringing a high-end look was the kind of the, the establisher for like how this is going to be different from the other documentaries that have been done before, I guess. And, you know, obviously they had a lot of, a lot of kind of reasons to have to make it look different because it was Netflix, because it was, you know, it had the 4k Absolutely. kind of element to it that, you know, it needs a certain look and what have you. So, so Diego had, had, had chosen to, to shoot on, I think at, at the time it was F55, so Sony F55s. Um, and he was, you know, he was set on on making it look, you know, if you if you were to shoot a drama or if you were to shoot whatever it might be, a feature even, he was going to use that same kit on a documentary, I feel like. Like, you know, he was going to bring that that look to something where arguably it shouldn't be. Um, so I, I just took my hat off to that. And then as obviously he started to kind of eventually crew up certain people, he was crewing ultimately like all of all, me, Steve Sinclair, Scott Coulter, like all people who, and obviously there was a lot of other PDs and stuff involved. That, um, so they, they, you know, had to continue that look on. And we all were coming at it from from probably more of a, a creative short film or, you know, TV drama world. So we had a, an aesthetic already in our heads. Um, so we were just kind of matching what Diego had already set, really. So we weren't necessarily coming into it and, and thinking, 
oh, it's got to look like this. We were just kind of going, all right, well, this is the, we know what this should look like because of yeah. the first series. So I think that just continued on into the second series. And all of the, you know, I'd take nothing away from all of the guys who were doing it full time, who were the PDs and stuff on that on that series, because they were they were instrumental and obviously following following the, the players and following the lives. And But all of that high-end cinema kind of kit was used throughout the duration. And I think that ultimately was, was why it looked probably a little yeah. bit different I guess and, and looked a bit more high end and the consistency I think is a, is definitely down to Diego setting that look in the first series in my mind. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about your other projects, your music videos and your commercials. Is there anything that really stands out for you? Yeah I mean again I think it was um, you know as, as, as a result of being in Picture Canon and stuff like I was saying earlier like people people used to come in all the time and be hiring random bits of bulbs and like people that I'd never heard of were suddenly hiring, you know, quite expensive camera kits. And I was kind of thinking, Oh, like I don't even know who this guy is. So, and there was one, there was one day where a guy came in um, and was, was hiring a Ronin two. Um, and I was, you know, I was saying, Oh, like, do you want us to show you through it? And, and what have you. And, and this guy turned out to be um, a guy called Ollie Rillands, who was a director and who's now a really good friend. Um, and he professed that he knew everything about this Ronin and he, you know, he didn't need to be shown and all this kind of thing. Um, and only, it's only now years later that he admits that he used it for one shot and couldn't figure out how to use it for the rest <laughs> of the shoot that he had. Um, but he, off, off the back of meeting him, he kind of had seen on my Instagram, which is, you know, a, a crazy, crazy tool in itself that I was taking a lot of, a lot of photos and kind of the aesthetic that I had and, I guess I'd seen little bits and bobs that I'd done in the past, and and he asked us if I if I wanted to to do a commercial with with him and another guy called Wayne Hilton. Um, so we ended up doing a a commercial for Anna Gardens, yeah. So we ended up doing that, um, and that was the first commercial that I'd really done that was going to be put out out on TV and was going to be. Um, put in the cinema so I again you know just fumbling on all of these opportunities was just like oh yeah I can make it look really good I can do this I can do that like didn't really have a clue what I was doing but we had we had great kit and we had um, great you know great people behind it um, so yeah we, we we shot that and and you know came out really nice and we shot I think we shot on um, crystal anamorphics for that so oh, it was nice. like you know it was a different look so we were straight away going for something that just looked different and me and Ollie had kind of chatted a lot about um how we wanted to to bring a different look and that ended up being anamorphic and we chatted about how much we loved anamorphic and all this kind of thing so I very quickly became Ali anamorphic <laughs> off the back of that because I just wanted to shoot everything anamorphic once I did one job um on anamorphic so and I started kind of doing more and more little bits of commercials whilst I was still working at Picture Cannon um because it's only, it's probably only, I've been left now there maybe a year and a half when I left Picture Cannon. So all of those opportunities were coming up a bit more frequently whilst I was there. And sometimes, obviously, it was having a clash. You know, I, I wasn't able to, to do or yeah. take certain jobs because I was working at the rental house. So um, it was a, it was with a massive heavy heart and a massive, like, what am I doing? I'm an idiot for leaving, like, Picture Cannon. But I was starting to get more regular kind of work shooting things um, and that's kind of why why I decided to leave at the, at when I did but all of those commercials fed into eventually kind of starting to shoot a little bit of, of short films and and things that ultimately now like I know my my like route is by no means like set and I've, I'm still learning like I, like I mentioned but like I've still got a lot lot to learn but I'm trying now to navigate through that short film route and trying to shoot more often and taking advice from from the likes of Sai, who would, would always say it was, you know, mate, like, if you want to be a DOP, like, show us your reel. And I'd be like, oh, like, I haven't shot enough to really put a reel together. And he'd be like, right, well, who's who's going to give you a job as a DOP if you don't have any stuff to show me that I can trust that you can do the job? Yeah. And those all of those comments would always just make us think, like, yeah, he's right. Like, I need I need to, to be shooting more regularly and, that's where I am now, I guess. It's just obviously minus pandemic and all of all of those things that obviously shattered a lot of those um, opportunities. But there's definitely still good opportunities coming up um, for the future with music videos and what have you. And 
I shot a music video back end of last year for a guy called Andrew Cushion, who's kind of like a like an up and coming um, artist, like a singer songwriter in the northeast. Um, and he just recently worked with Noel Gallagher on uh, on a, on this track. So I was I'm a massive Oasis fan, and, and I was approached to to help this guy do a music video and. That was another great opportunity where you know I was just like, this is class. Like I'm, I'm loving this. Like because it was a perfect excuse to be a bit creative, and and obviously I had a great relationship with Jamie at Picture Cannon. So all of these things that had kind of come before and that I'd built on and the foundation that I'd built, obviously then meant that I could, you know, I could kind of call upon all of these great connections that I'd made and all of these great people. Yeah, and it's it's such a great route as well. So you're obviously meeting so many different people and from so many different disciplines across the industry. And especially, especially I think in in Newcastle because there is only one rental company. Like you know, and there there is just I mean it's now Canon Twenty Four, but at the time there were Picture Canon, and and those guys are the only people in in Newcastle as far as probably you know you go to Manchester or Leeds, and um, and you know there's other rental companies, but we are we were the only ones there so everyone who came into that place was a working person in the industry who who you would know so all of these connections that you would make would all be then people that if you got called on to do go out and do a job um you know chances are you're going to meet someone that you'd already met in the rental company so i i had all of these great connections established from having like brush shoulders with so many of these people so it was it was definitely the route that I'm honestly so grateful to to Jamie for and and to Steve Sinclair for getting us involved in that because it it did offer us almost like a fast track like not not to say that it, you know I'm I'm better for it or worse for it or whatever but it did definitely present opportunities that I would never have had and you know I'd pro- I would probably still be fumbling my way through doing a lot of assistant stuff um yeah. on on dramas and stuff and not to say that that's you know a, a bad route by any means that's a route that a lot of people take but for me i just think for someone who was desperate to be shooting and desperate to be out and about and doing jobs and you know i guess just having having opportunities in a different way um it was the perfect route for me because it just allowed us to do so much stuff that i just could experiment with ultimately like you know the pressure was on because obviously you've got to do a job and you've got to do it well but it gave us opportunities when I was shooting stuff to just go right well I'm going to try this camera this week or you know I've got this job for a friend and you know like with Ollie like we literally just were like right I'm going to shoot on a mini and we're going to shoot up with these anamorphics and it that, like in what world would that ever be <laughs> something that you could just decide Excellent. on unless you were in a rental company and that that for me, it was literally purely just because Jamie was so class with like literally saying to us, "Mate, take take what you need." Obviously, you know, there's there's we need money to pay for this kit if you're going to go and do this job. But if you decide you want to use something, go out and use it like it's Brilliant. there to be used. So Jamie was always amazing with that, and and that's obviously what just gave me the chance to to try so many different things in a, in a creative sense, I guess, and and navigate to develop in a somewhat of a style, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So in terms of like your, your own personal development and what you're working on now, um, to, to obviously help you get to that next level, what, what sort of things are you mm. really concentrating on now? Is it, is it all portfolio or is there any sort of, are you doing reading and bits and pieces like that? What, what do you mm. do in your, in your sort of time to personally develop I think I've I've always been someone who who's just wanted to wanted to digest information constantly. Like I've never been a great reader by any means. I n- really haven't. Um, but I've always been someone who's been extremely visual. Um, and that sounds like such a pretentious thing to say, but like genuinely, I, I'm someone who would look through a book and look at the pictures and just not really take in the information, but see something and be like, you know, almost take more from it because I could look at a visual. Um, so I've always been someone who would look at look at other people's work, you know, look at look at books, look at things that ultimately would always be cinematography based. And like now, like throughout the lockdown period and stuff, like I just found myself buying hordes of books, and <laughs> you know, whether that be photographers or cinematographers. Like I bought a, a, a whole load of Robert Frank books, um, and just like you know, all of these things that I can basically just take in a style of someone and like almost try and just almost force himself into, into 
acknowledging how it is that they develop their style and trying to, in my mind, take the best of all of these different things um, and then try and use that to develop my own style, I guess. But I always, I always just like, you know, I look at the likes of Cy, like Cy Bell, who's, who's, you know, shot Peaky Blinders and, you know, he, he's from the world that I was from in terms of like, you know, from a, from a small city um, who, which didn't have a massive industry and, you know, I'm not by any means trying to compare myself to Sai, but I look at Sai's work and I think, well, you know, he's someone that I can, I can on a personal level, like I can chat to and say, how did you develop your style? Like how, how did you get these things? So all of these opportunities, like, you know, of getting to talk to people, like I recently um, applied for a, a BSC mentorship um, and managed to get onto that. And, Brilliant. and I was very luckily paired with, with Sam McCurdy, who is another Geordie, massive cinematographer from 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 our region so he we were having zoom calls and stuff throughout the lockdown and he was working in canada so we're trying to kind of line up to to chat to each other and he was he was on lost in space a netflix job um massive massive job and you know that provided again another insight to speak to someone who i could talk to on a completely personal level and understand how he's developed his own style and how he's how he's approach how he approach approaches certain bits of lighting and you know all of these things that I, I like to think now that I'm in a, such a fortunate position to be able to have these guys numbers and just say like you know I've, I've got this th- this job coming up or you know my jobs are obviously way smaller than anything that they're doing at the minute but they're so good in that if I say that, like you know I've I've lit this in this way and this is how it turned out what like what do you think of it like there are people who I can hopefully like in my mind. I can send a message to and they're not, they're not bugged by it. They're not going, Oh, like this is, you know, I'm sick of this kid banging on about whatever. Um, it, they're, they're more kind of doing it to, to help aid me develop a style and to try and, you know, suggest ideas. And so those are all things that I think just help me personally to, to just stay creative and stay, stay like aware. Like for me, you know, not to by any means quote Roger Deakins, but like, they like someone like Roger Deakins is obviously aware that ultimately people will try and say that's clearly a Roger Deakins film or that's clearly stylized in a way that he would shoot something. But ultimately he's trying to serve the story. And for me, that's kind of where I always like to think that I'm coming at things like not necessarily to go, Oh, I'm going to shoot this like Ali Hutchinson shoot shot. It. Like more just, these are things that worked on the last job or, and, could they be implemented into this similar story? And if they can be, then obviously you might see some similar themes or whatever, but I'm not necessarily someone who's going to approach every job the same way, because I think, you know, if you, if that's kind of the route you take and then maybe it's becoming a little bit pain by numbers and it's not, you're not looking to develop. Um, so I'm always kind of trying to, to try new things, whether that be like, you know, a, a new lens or a new camera or, you know, something as simple as a you know a new filter or light something with a different source, whatever that might be. I'm always just trying to, I guess, somewhat experiment a little bit and to try and further that style because I don't think I'll ever land on a style where I'm like, this is my thing. Like, this is a hundred percent how I'm going to do things from now because yeah. I think that'll just constantly develop, like, yeah, in time. So good stuff. So, yeah. Um, what what sort of things are you working on at the moment? Then I mean, obviously with with lockdown and things at the moment, it's it's tricky to actually actually sort of get shoots lined up and things. And there is yeah. stuff happening, but it's not obviously as busy as what it was pre lockdown and pre COVID. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what what sort of things? Uh, what sort of jobs are you working on at the moment or preparing for at the moment? So at the moment, um, I've got a short film coming up, um, just a two day in the next in the next week, just a two day um short film, which is a kind of comedy short which I was approached by Sam Gunny um, who's a, a director that I've never actually worked with but we had we did have a commercial lined up to do together um, and then it fell through because of COVID so yeah, it was just before yeah. COVID kind of came um, but we, we we were chatting so much so through lockdown and what have you that we've eventually now landed on on doing this short together so um, that's one that's coming up so that'll, that'll be kind of a fun a fun job um, and then I've got development with a guy I mentioned earlier, Ollie Rillands, and um, another another mate of mine, Drew Michael, who um, actually drums for for Sam Fender. So we're kind of working on on a short film that we're going to do together. 
Um, we've got a lot of a lot of big plans um, on on what we're going to do with that. But all of all of the kind of things that I'm working on at the minute seem to be all more like narratively based and more more kind of working towards things that are going to have a bit more of a short film kind of feel them, I guess. Um, Cause that's kind of the thing that I'm trying to do more of, I guess. Um, so that, and then, and then um, just music videos. Yeah. So I've got another, another two Andrew Cushion music videos and then, yeah, just taking, taking all everything that comes really. I think we've got a lot of commercial bits with Ollie again coming up um, with Ollie and Wayne. So yeah, all, all of these little things that kind of, at the minute, it feels like almost like they're not going to happen because you just, I'm so used to things just like turning to mush <laughs> and like COVID just turned so many things upside down. But I think just trying to stay positive and trying to stay creative and like I bought, I stupidly bought like a, a, an expensive like, Leica camera at the, at the start of the lockdown, not knowing that it was going to happen, obviously. But trying to stay creative, like with going out and just going with the purpose of let's take some photos yeah. and just trying to stay motivated and all of those things, I think have obviously like try to make us more well, just made us more hungry for when work does start up again. Definitely. And now that it is, I'm just desperate to do more creative stuff and yeah, so it's it's good, man. No, definitely. And I've seen a lot of your your like of photography on your on your Instagram yeah. as well. It's good. It's got it's got a lot of life to it, <laughs> and that's you, that's yeah, yeah, that's what I really you. like. Yeah, it's really nice. Thank you, mate. For, for what you've learned and what you've learned so far, obviously we've both got a long way to go. Um, I'm sort of early thirties, yeah. but I still feel like I've just I've I've not learned anything yet. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, what 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 would you say to sort of people that are in that position that are either sort of like late late teens, early twenties that are looking to either start out, or those that are like me that are in that position where we're sort of swamped by corporate work to the extent that we can't create up, we can't concentrate on the the projects that we really want to do. What what sort of advice would yeah. you give to those people? I mean, that 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 for me is is a re it's a, such a hard one, isn't it? Because like. You know, I'm I'm not from a background that that is you know privileged in in the sense of like having having a parent that's come from the industry or yeah. or anyone anyone that I really knew like like I say other than a friend who I, who I very briefly knew. But I think it's really hard to to get that balance because obviously when you want to do something creative, ultimately like what drives you in the in the first instance is the passion for wanting to do something yeah. creative, like like I say, but you then have to balance that with obviously earning a bit of money, which is the hardest part of all of this. Um, and if you, if you're in a position where you ultimately have to work to to maintain living, which all of us do, um, then you almost have to kind of put that on the back burner, which I definitely had to do from time to time. But and I still have to do now a lot of the time. There's still things where you know I have to take take a job. Um, that maybe sounds a little more dull rather than the most creative job that I would often want to go for. But I do think it's getting that blend of, you know, do do whatever you'd have to do to make money, but also try and stay creative. And whether that's just something as simple as, like I mentioned earlier, like just taking a camera out and spending a day, just go around, take photos, take a whole load of great photos, take, sorry, a whole load of crap photos and then look at them and go, why the crap? Why don't I like that? Why? You know, be your own critic in, in a lot of ways. And if you can even do that, like, you know, once a week, then you can progress that into then trying and go and shooting things with friends or, you know, it's, it's easier said than done, undoubtedly, but building connections with people that, you know, may be able to help you in the future, like going to a rental company and, and trying to say, you know, like, something as daft as, you know, I'll come in every Saturday and, and work for free for like, you know, for a couple of hours so I can then play with a camera or look at a lens that I've never looked at or all of those things to me, like I might be completely wrong in saying that, but I would imagine most rental companies would be willing to let you go in and experiment with all those things and have access to those things that you maybe would never otherwise have a chance to, to access. So I mean, whether I feel like I may be veering off from the question a little yeah, bit, but well. for me, it's it's more just making sure that you can try and maintain a living because that is, you know, yeah, that's so important. But also, don't lose the hope in that, you know, if you maybe work in, in a standard nine to five job and you you still want to become, you know, someone in in the industry or whatever that might be, don't lose the the drive because if ultimately if you if you can be creative 
and you can maintain being creative and you have such a drive that make sure that you'll get to to be in in that industry someday whether that's when you're when you're 30 whether that's when you're you know 40 or whatever it might be i might again might be way off with with the ages and stuff but what i'm trying to say is don't ever lose the drive for getting to where you want to be because you don't know how quickly that could progress and you don't know how you might meet the right person and you might have an opportunity thrown at you like i did and you might suddenly found find that your career has been sped up and and you might be really fortunate but first and foremost for me it's just about trying to maintain being creative whilst also trying to be realistic and and not put yourself in any financial pit because i think that's that's what i what i hear most of all like you know when i whenever i speak to someone who's completely new to the industry i almost feel like i don't want to i by no means want to put people off but I also want them to, to not think that, you know, it's it's one of those that you can just waltz in and suddenly you're earning hundreds of thousands of pounds or anything close to that. You know, it, it's ultimately a creative industry that, yes, people get paid very well when they get the highest level, but it's it's a lot of work to get to that level. Like, you know, you you, you don't you don't just waltz into that. And and I think everyone's gonna be different in, in how they'll progress and and when they'll progress and you know what what job roles they take um obviously are dictated by you know a lot of different variables but i think the main thing like i say is to just continue on being creative and if you can maintain that you'll you'll get to hopefully do something that you 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 would be doing anyway and get paid for it absolutely absolutely but well, ali we're uh we're pretty much at the end of the podcast so i've just got one one final question for you which is to do with yeah. the desert island kit bag so uh yeah imagine set the scene for you stranded on a desert island you've only you've only been able to save one camera one lens and one light from your kit bag what what would you go for to and what would you save to obviously document your time on the island um it would for camera. I'm gonna go with what probably ninety percent of the world would go for, and that would be Alexa Mini. It would have to be. Um, obviously, now we've got the LF, so I'd probably because I could, I would go with the LF. <laughs> nice. um, and then lens wise, for for me, I mentioned them briefly on 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 that job, that the commercial job that we did a few years ago with Ollie, and that was a Crystal Express, which was actually a Cook version. So it was an old an old vintage anamorphic lens. Um, and it would probably be, I would imagine, a 50 mil. So, you know, give us enough range to to be able to see how much C was out there, I guess. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then she would go with it. We'll go with a, a sky panel again. I'm probably that's probably the most, you know, everyone would probably say that that answer in the combination that I've probably just said. But a sky panel for me is is a great one because it is so versatile and, you know, you, you yeah, a lot of options and plus as well it's got a party mode and if you know if you're stranded on an island by yourself <laughs> you at least want to have a party for one don't you, you, know, exactly. you want to have some kind of source of entertainment so you might as well have not that i'd have anywhere to plug it in mine but you know <laughs> oh no well obviously there's a there's a generator on the island with plenty oh, yeah, of fuel yeah, of left in it ali we'll have to wrap up there but thank you so much for coming on this week's under the lights podcast it's been great to have you i wish you all the best with your career i'm sure it'll be a long and fruitful one and judging by our conversation it'll be a very successful one too and that's the end of season one we're going to take a couple of weeks break just to recoup rethink and book some great new guests in if you've enjoyed this week's podcast remember to subscribe and go back and listen to our previous episodes we will be back soon but in the meantime make sure your entries in for the fantastic doug allen competition thanks once more for listening all the best and i'll see you soon under the lights podcast